Okay, let's get started. And the topic of today's lecture is um, mathematical models of networks. So in, we'll be talking about several basic models of uh, network formation. And there are like three models we're going to cover today. Um, so there is a model of random graphs. Um, and this is like one of the oldest and most famous model. It's also called um, Erdos-Schrenyi model uh, by the name um, of the people. These are the names of the people who created models. And there is a famous paper of Erdos and Rene going back to 1960s. It's Paul Erdos, the famous mathematician, um, who pretty much re revolutionized the, the, the world of, of graph study, um, offering the model of random graphs. Um, and then there are several modern day models, which is uh, preferential attachment. Um, and that this model came out you know, in, in um, late 90s and small world model. So the models number two and number three, these are, um, they appeared um, when people start studying uh, networks over again, you know, like 10, 15 years ago. Um, and just a few sort of g general points about the models and modeling. Um, so these are what's called generative models. So they allow you to generate graphs, create graphs. And um, the whole point of model is to um, you know, somewhat simplify reality and introduce certain type of control parameters that allows you uh, to change the properties of the graph that you're generating. And um, you, within the model, you want to balance sort of the complexity of the model and um, the explanatory power. So you, yes, you do, uh, of course, the model has to explain some of the observable properties of the actual phenomenon, like in this case, a graph. But at the same time, models shouldn't be very complicated. Um, it should remain a model. So you should have some simple parameters, and by tuning those, um, you should be able to change the behavior of the model. So um, the reason for studying those models, there are several reasons uh, to study and learn those models. So um, one sort of major reason is, um, you know, if we can come up with a model that explains particular behavior or sort of can generate um, specific graph, um, we might think of the, the process um, that generates a graph. So um, it's still an open question why graphs in nature um, the, the exist, the, the, why the existing graphs in nature are the way they are. So why they have this power law distribution, why they have you know, the small world effect. And um, different models attempts uh, to, to, to sort of model the, that, that, those features. Um, and by modeling them, they also try to sort of come up or, or come up with ideas, you know, how come up with ideas of the processes, how those graphs have been generated. So, First of all, it allows us to think about the processes, how graphs were generated. Um, second, uh, models are very good because you can actually control with parameters. Um, you can um, sort of adjust and, and make the, the graphs look the way they are. And um, you know, sometimes it can be hard to get um, a real world graph of certain scale uh, with you know, the, the desired properties. As we, and with models, you can actually generate those graphs. Um, and, and third, uh, reason would be that, uh, and, and that mostly concerns, let's say, random graph. In many cases, we'll be comparing um, the graphs that we have with appropriate random graphs, and just to make sure that whatever we observe in, in, in real data um, is not by chance, but um, there is, this is a real sort of feature in the real data. And to do that, we'll compare that graph against random graph. Like, for example, you know, you would take a graph and we say, um, let's look at how many sort of triangles in the graph. You can count how many there are. Um, and the question would be, okay, well, um, is this a lot or not? And what you can do, one of the ways to, to understand if that's a lot of uh, triangles in the graph is to compare that against a similar size random graph. Because in the random graph, um, you know, triangles there will be at random. And, and so um, if in your graph, um, the number of triangles is approximately as in the random graph, well, you know, that means um, that they're there by chance, right? They're there at random. Um, but at the same time, if you have the same size graph, you have many more triangles than in the random graph. It can tell you something about this particular graph that by whatever reason, 
you know, the transitivity is very, very high there. So these are three models, and let's jump into them. Um, here are the features, and we talked about those features in the previous lectures that we would like models to reproduce. So first of all, um, real-world real graphs, um, they do have this power law, um, heavy tail tick redistribution. Um, so the fact that um, in the graph there are a lot of uh, nodes with a, with a small degree, a few nodes with a very, very high degree. Um, second property was the small average distance um, and graph diameter in general. It's pretty small, so it's a small world. Um, and, and third property we talked about is the large clustering coefficient or actually a loss of triangles in the graphs. Um, there are more um, sort of more properties we haven't touched upon, but um, one of them is also sort of jumping out at you, the fact that in real graphs there are usually what's called giant connected components. So um, the majority of nodes are actually are reachable from each other. And so here are these um, three models. Each of those models will try to explain these properties. Um, you know, yeah. Some will be able to explain it, others will not. Um, but we'll see how it works. Um, in, in principle, you, you will see um, that random graph model um, easily explains um, giant, connected giant connected component um, and uh, small average distance. Um, barbashi albert preferential attachment model uh, reproduces power law distribution. Um, and uh, the small world model by watson Strogatz is actually tries to um, capture all these three properties, but there is sort of parameter um, that you can control to adjust it. Um, you'll see that neither of the models can actually reproduce all of those features, and there are models today that are based on these three, the combination of base of three that actually can reproduce all the features, but um, again, we're going to study the sort of the, the most fundamental uh, models to just get an idea where things coming from. So, um, random graph model, this is actually goes back to 1959. And, and the idea is, is the following. So we have a, um, let's say we, 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 we are given, um, it's actually the model that, um, there, there are a set of models that um, Erdos and Rene proposed. Um, we're going to consider one of those models, it's called GNP. So what that means is the following. We are given two parameters, this, um, the model, G and P um, has two parameters, N and P. So N is a number of nodes that are given. And these are nodes, number of nodes. And P is a probability that two nodes um, is connected. So you can think about the construction of this graph in the following way. So you're given some number of nodes, okay? Oh, there is another node, and here is another node. And then um, you start a process by which every pair of nodes can be connected with some probability. So you pretty much take a pair of nodes, say this node and this node, and flip a coin, and um, if, you know, the, 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 we have a probability, well, it's, it's a biased coin, right, and so, um, you have a probability P that those two nodes be connected. And let's say, you know, if, if uh, the, the, the random um, number that, or the flip of coin says that, okay, well, here is a probability higher than what's given, we connect them. Then there is another pair, and if the probability is, if, if, you know, with a probability P, we connect them. And, you know, we can connect this pair, and maybe, you know, maybe this pair get connected, et cetera. So you go through all the pairs, and connect each pair with a probability P. And so P, in some sense, controls um, how many edges you get in the graph. But at the same time, number of edges <clears throat> is a random number. Why? Well, because <coughs> it's a probabilistic process, and it means if we try to, say, you know, take the same, the same nodes, actually, let me do it this way. We take the same nodes and run the process um, again, this time, it could be these two nodes that get connected, um, this node get connected, this and this get connected, and maybe here we get an, an, an edge. And so we get a you know, different graph with different number of edges. 
But in both cases, the graph will have um, n nodes, and the probability that any two nodes connected is p. So in this case, um, the total number of edges in the graph will be an average, right? It's, it's expectation. Um, and it is equal to um, the probability p times the all possible number of connections. n times n minus 1 over 2 is the maximal possible number um, of connections between, uh, the, between n nodes, right? Um, and, and the reason for that is because, well, this is, this is the maximum possible number. And with a probability p, um, things get connected. So average in this case is this probability times the total possible number. And we can also easily estimate, um, on average, what the average node degree would be in this graph. So average node degree um, is just the sum over all, no, over all node degrees. And we know, we already seen that in the previous lectures, that it's the sum over all ki, over all node degrees, is actually twice, is equal to twice number of edges. And edges we got here. So we can plug that in, um, and, and we usually will be interested with large n's, with n's much greater than one. So we, you'll usually be interested in graphs with a lot of nodes. And so on average, average node degree will be p times n. Now, we're going to be using this um, all the time, that the average node degree is p times n. Um, you can think about it the following way. Again, p is a probability that nodes are connected. And um, if p is becoming very large, say p is equal to 1, that means um, that every edge that is possible exists in the graph. And, and so you will get node connected. Uh, each node will be connected with every other node. Right? And if that happens, if that happens, of course, the degree, uh, for, uh, the degree of every node um, will be equal to n minus 1 because it has n minus 1 you know, neighbors uh, if it is connected to all the neighbors. And so average k <laughs> is p times n. And you can also estimate um, the, the, the density of the graph. And density of the graph um, defined usually as the total number of edges that exist divided by the maximum possible number. And density is also equal to p. So the parameter p, the probability that two um, nodes are connected, is uh, really the density of, is equal to the density of the graph that we'll get. OK, any questions so far? OK. OK, now the, 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 the hard part, sort of. Um, we would like to estimate the, the probability of the distribution of the node degrees. So in, in this graph, when we have a random graph, and so things, some things connected and, and uh, you know, there was this random process, um, we would like to know um, the distribution of the node degrees. Well, which means the following. Um, we would like to see, okay, how many nodes in, within this random process, how many nodes will have degree um, one? So how many nodes will have degree one? How many nodes will have degree one? How many nodes will have degree zero? How many nodes will have degree one? How many nodes will have degree two, three, etc.? And then we, can, then we can convert that into probabilities and just say, okay, so if we pick up a random node, um, what's the probability that the node has degree zero, one, two, three, etc.? So that's distribution, that's the probability distribution. Now, in the case of the random graph, it's actually pretty easy to calculate uh, because we consider this as a um, independent random process, which is um, every pair of nodes uh, connected um, independently of any of um, other pairs. Um, and in some sense, the formula for this, it, and this becomes Bernoulli process, um, the formula for, for the probability in the Bernoulli process, it's um, repetitive independent trials. So um, it's the same idea. You probably have seen that before on, 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 on statistics or whatever. Imagine that um, the, the classical problem with explanation for this is this like, shooting range and um, you know, trying, somebody trying to shoot the target and the probability of actually hitting the target from one shot is given to you. And let's say, I don't know, it's 
one third. One. So the question is, okay, if you make 10 shots, what the probability that you hit the target, say, five times, right? So to calculate that probability, what you need to do is you need to take um, the probability to hit the target, right? Um, okay, let's say not five times, let's make it four times. Um, so the probability to hit the target and um, if you want to hit the target four, ti four times, well, it has to be p times to the four, to the fourth power. Then it means also that you need to miss six times. And so probability of miss is one minus p. And you have to do it six times, so it's the power of six, because it's all the events that should happen, right? So you should um, get four times, and you should miss, miss six times. Um, and, and then um, there is a question is, you know, if you shoot 10 times, well, you can, actually hit the target you know the first four times or the se or, or the first time the third time the fifth and the seventh time um, so the question is okay uh, we need to count all the possible arrangements of four uh, shots that actually hit the target out of ten shots and that's given um, normally by uh, c4 out of um, out of out of ten right so how to choose um, four numbers out of ten um, and, and that gives you this, this, the probability that um, you will hit four times out of ten. You, if, if you have a probability to hit the target once, uh, little p. It's exactly the same story here um, because we're trying to uh, estimate the node degree, the distribution of the node degree for a node in this sort of in a random process. And um, if we pick up a node, it will have a degree k if it is connected to k uh, to k nodes, right? So the node will have k edges um, if it is connected to k nodes, and the probability for a node to be connected with some other node is just p. So the probability for a node to connect to k nodes will be p to the power k. But there are, so that will give me the probability for a node to be connected to k neighbors. But there are other nodes out there this particular node will not be connected to. And if the node has k connections, it will not have n minus k minus 1 connections. Because the possible, maximal possible number of connections for this node would be um, n minus 1, because it can connect to um, any node in the, in, um, in the graph. And, um, but we know it's connected to k nodes because it has degree k. So um, p to the k is a probability that's connected to k nodes, and 1 minus p um, is a probability that it is not connected to the rest of the nodes. Um, and, and finally, this is a number of ways to select those k nodes um, your particular um, node is connected to. And so putting this together, it gives you the distribution function or the probability that randomly selected node has k neighbors. It's a sort of exactly the same as at this you know, shooting exercise. And um, for this distribution, if you take um, n uh, becoming, if you take n to be very large, um, but um, you know, fixing the value of p times n, then um, it becomes the distribution becomes. Uh, what's called Bernoulli distribution, um, where it is average k to the power k, e to the minus k, um, like divided by k factorial. Now, um, this is sort of you know, an exercise you can do if you have enough skills. Um, you can actually show that, that, that the limiting of that formula, limit of that formula for large n is, is this formula. So guys, have you seen this, the, the, the Bernoulli distribution before? Anywhere? No. Okay, well, it's, it's, it's good to, you know, to see it at least for the first time. <laughs> um, whenever you look at, this, at, the, at the random processes, this is probably one of the um, distributions that comes up like all the time. Um, anyway, what's interesting about this distribution is the following. Again, this distribution tells you what is the probability that randomly selected node has certain node degree. All right, and um, that's what this distribution looks like. 
Um, so what it says is the following. Um, if let's say this distribution, if this, if this distribution, so parameter lambda is uh, sort of average node degree. So if the distribution is given, um, has a certain values of p times n, which is equal to 10, you will get, say, this curve. And that curve um, tells you the following. Well, it's a distribution with a peak around 10. So which means if you randomly select a node, it most likely will have a degree um, 10. But what's most important is that other nodes you know, will have a degrees a little bit less than 10 or a little bit more than 10. But that's about it. You will not have nodes in this graph with a very high degree, and you will have very little nodes with a very low degree. So this is very different from this power law distribution we talked about uh, before. Um, but you know, that's what the model gives. Now, I'll just show you a few graphs, uh, you know, how, what they look like, um, the, the, the uh, random graphs, and that sort of make it easier to understand. Um, but the point is, um, I would like to make is the following before we get into the pictures. We really do the following. We, we, have, we have the bunch of nodes, and we have a parameter p that controls the probability that two nodes are connected. And it's clear that, that when p is equal to zero, this graph is empty, right? The, the, if, if we say the probability that any two nodes are connected um, is equal to zero, the graph is empty. At the same time, um, it's also clear that if we say that the probability that any two nodes are connected is equal to one, um, it's a complete graph. Every node is connected to every node. So somehow, when p is changing between zero and one, so we increase the value of p, um, you know, the, the, the structure appears in the graph. Things start getting connected. And you know, it's probably at some moment of time, for some value of p, we start seeing the sort of big structures where um, things getting connected. So it's one of those sort of typical, well, stories imagine, you know, people at the party and uh, um, let's say, you know, nobody knows, no one knows um, no one, right? So people came to the party and you, you, you come to the party, you don't know anybody. Um, any other person came to the party, he doesn't know anybody. And so people start meeting and talking, introducing to each other and talking. And so after a while, it seems like, you know, pretty much everybody's either know everybody else or at least there is sort of connection between people. So people start introducing each other because they, they already met. Um, and, and so you get the sort of connectivity in, in this cluster, in, in this graph. So there, there is some, it sounds like there should be some value of P where the graph switches from this entirely disconnected bunch of nodes into the, this connected component where things where you can actually get from one node following the edges to almost any other node. And it's, there, there is indeed this critical uh, value of P, it's called um, uh, percolation threshold. And we'll talk about it in a second. So here are the pictures, you know. And, and um, you know, to answer actually your question on R, one of the answers would be okay. You can actually easily, easily reproduce those pictures in R um, because of you know this this nice library, right? The the iGraph library. So what we see on the left is a typical random graph with a small uh, value of p less than this p critical, and we'll see what p critical is in a second. Um, what you see here is a just bunch of you know some strangely shaped subgraphs sort of spread around and they're they're disconnected so this is a small value of p this this means that for this graph it's a small probability that the nodes are connected but it's not zero and so you know sometimes you get this sort of the structures when we reach now um when we reach this critical value p c when we reach that value all of a sudden, a bunch of these little small subgraphs, they actually join, and we start seeing this big structure. 
it actually takes a big chunk of the of the graph. So, so what happens is let's call percolation happen. Uh, the, the phase transition here. And if we keep increasing um, P, the probability, things start growing. And all of a sudden you see that there is this you know, gigantic connected component that pretty much connects almost all of the nodes in the graph. And this whole process happens really, really quickly with um, increase of the probability that the two nodes are connected. So you go from um, separate little pieces into all of a sudden, you know, the, the global structure, and, and then everything is becoming connected. And this is controlled by the probability that two random nodes are connected. By the way, notice here we get some funny structures here. We got cycle here, for example. Um, so there are a lot of interesting little structures that appear in the graph. And the power of the model is that it's very controllable. So there is theoretical prediction um, when this will happen and what type of structures will appear in the graph. Okay. Um, so that's why everybody loves this random graph model because you, know, you can really calculate all kinds of moments within the graph. And uh, you know, if you keep sort of growing graph, uh, growing P, you know, graph will look like that. And, and this is, um, for example, this um, is calculated for um, average node degree equal to five. And just to remind you, it is P times N. And in this case, um, I, I generated this graph yesterday and N um, was um, 200. So P then is five divided by 200, right? So that's the value for the P that has been selected. So what we see on the right is actually the distribution of the node degrees in the graph. Well, this means the following, that the typical node in this graph, typical node, if I pull out the node at random, right? The most likely it will have a node degree of five. But there are nodes in this graph um, that have degree less than five, and there are nodes that have degree greater than five. So there are, for example, some nodes with degree 10, and, and, and some nodes even with degree, you know, let's say 14, there is probably a node there, um, node or two with degree 14, but there are very, very few of them. So majority of the nodes have this degree. And, and the rest of them just sort of a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. Okay. So that's what this model gives us. And, and, and that is different from what we see in real life, um, where we talked about last time there is this power law distribution. Here we do not get that power law. What we get is, um, well, Bernoulli distribution. So one can show, and you know, if you're interested, um, you can check in the papers how it's done. One can show that the critical value, in fact, is one over n. Or in other words, um, what's important is p times n, where p is a probability um, that two nodes are connected and n is a number of nodes in the graph. And what we need to do is to compare this value to one. When uh, p times n greater than one or p times n um, less than one. Now, why is uh, P times N? Well, the, the reason for that is very simple. It's actually very, very intuitive. Um, think about it this way. The average number of neighbors for a node is actually equal to P times N. And if you have a node with one neighbor, right? The only thing that you know, could exist, if you think about this, how a node can have one neighbor. Well, it's probably, you know, well, in this kind of structure, every node has one neighbor. But even if I do this, this node has one neighbor, this node has one neighbor, but this already has two neighbors. So average number of neighbors per node will be greater than, than one. And um, if you think about any structure with, with more connections, average number of neighbors per node has to be greater than one. Otherwise, they will not be connected into one structure. It's impossible, right? Um, even for a line, it's not going to happen. 
And so it's very natural that the sort of the threshold for switching from this um, you know, separated behavior into one long behavior is a moment when average node degree is equal to one. So if I go back to this picture, this, uh, uh, this, this transition will happen when p times n equal to one, and, and p times n is average node degree. So the critical value of p, in other words, is one over n. So again, the, the reason, intuitive reason for this to happen is just because in order for things to get connected, you need to know more than one person, right? Because if you know only one person, well, you'll be connected to this person and that's about it, right? In order to be part of the society, well, you pretty much need to have more than one um, connection. Um, and, and this is a critical point where on average, if nodes have less than one, then um, you know, the, the, there is no a uh, gigantic connected component. And if it is more, there is one. Now, one thing to remember also is that this is an average, right? So it means, um, you know, some nodes can have degrees higher than, um, than one. And um, like, like, for example, here, right? There are some nodes with degree, you know, even there is degree here, three for the central node. But it's on average. There are a lot of nodes here that have degree zero, and when you add up all those node degrees, you will see that an average node degree here is less than one, okay? So the important thing to remember from this random graph model is the following. There are two parameters, parameter P, that gives you the probability that two nodes connected, and parameter N, which is the side of the graph. And what's really important for the performance, for the behavior of this model, is this product of P times N that is equal to average number of neighbors for every node. And when this is greater than one, when k um, average, when the number of no neighbors is greater than one, you get this gigantic connected component. When k is less than one, um, you get separate nodes. And at one, that's when this transition happens. I'll stop here for a second. Um, any questions? No questions. OK. All right. So, um, as I said, there are these parameters, and there are, every, you know, everything is computable for this type of graphs. Um, and um, you can actually estimate, for example, how many of the nodes will be in, in a different components. And you can show that, for example, when P is greater than this P critical, so greater than 1 over N, um, pretty much all nodes will be in this gigantic connected component. And when uh, P is just equal to this, uh, to the critical value. It will be that many nodes in the, in the, in the biggest component. Um, and uh, for example, when P is less than, than PC, the, the largest component will look like a tree. And we can go back to these pictures and, 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 and check it out that really the largest components here, these are trees. There is, they don't have loops. Um, and we can see that here, in this picture, almost all nodes belong to the gigantic connected component. And for this one, you could actually compute how many nodes in, you know, in, in this big structure. So all those properties can be analytically derived from the formulas. Um, this is also a very interesting and sort of useful graph. Um, it just tells you the percentile of the nodes that belongs to this gigantic connected component. And so what it shows is the following. Um, here on this x-axis, we show average number of neighbors per node, or you know, p times n. And when they're small, the graph consists of you know, separated nodes, as we saw there. And, and the size, there is no gigantic connected component. The, the, the size of it is really almost zero. And then at one, phase transition happens, and we get sort of our first structure in here. Lots of nodes became connected. And then the size of the structure starts growing, and you get more and more nodes connected to it. And when you get to this point, pretty much all nodes 
will be already belonging to this gigantic connected component. So this is a fraction of the nodes in the component. Here's pretty much all nodes will be there. Here is like, you know, 60% of the nodes will be there. And this whole thing starts at one, right? And the phase transition, well, if you go, you know, if you remember high school physics, it's, um, you know, water becoming ice, right? You're cooling down, cooling down the water, um, nothing happens, um, and then boom, uh, you, get, you get ice. And, um, and the, same, the same way, in some sense, the same way is here. Um, nothing happens for a while. The parameter P is increasing. You're getting sort of the higher and higher probability um, for nodes to be connected, but there is no structural changes within the graph. And then um, at some moment, um, all of a sudden, we got this gigantic component that appeared, and then it started growing, and very quickly, all nodes belong to that gigantic connected component. Okay, so this is a zoo sort of of, of the random of the random graphs. It, it's a great picture from um, Aaron Closet. Um, I should say that here um, he calls um, the average node degree um, as C. So that's this parameter. So what happens is the following. Um, N on the top is the number of neighbors, right? The, I'm sorry, is the, is the size of the graph. Um, and, and here we have the average node degree. And you can see how graphs changes, right? So here's the, um, you remember the, the, what's controlling everything is, uh, it is P times, uh, P times N, right? And, and you realize that um, when um, there's this, it's equal to one, um, we start seeing bigger structures. And um, when it's in significantly exceeding, um, you start seeing you know, loops, and it's more complex structures, and more and more and more and more. Okay. So by controlling the parameters, you can literally generate um, any structures in, in this sort of, in the zoo. And um, again, without going into many details, um, the model is so powerful that you can actually predict when in the model you start seeing different structures. So what's shown on this picture um, is, uh, is the following. So we, we can increase P, and when P is equal to N minus 1, right, or P equal 1 over N, you know, N minus one. This is when um, we, we have a phase transition and uh, you get gigantic connected components, but it's also the moment when we start seeing um, structures like, like loops. Um, and I just want to remind you, I'll, I'll sweep back for a sec. Um, in this picture, in this picture, look at this guy. Right. So um, right at the moment when 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 we we went through the um, through the phase transition, we got the first loop in there, and it is actually predictable that we get it. And so um, based on on what the values p of p um, you have, you will get different structures appearing in the graph. So you can actually tell, okay, well, uh, we get. We, we can get this structure in the graph, or we can get this structure in the graph, or if P is getting greater and P becoming, let's say, uh, proportional to one over N to one half, um, then you start all of a sudden seeing this uh, components, um, et cetera, et cetera. So again, the, the, the point of this picture uh, to show you that um, everything is controlled in this graph. Um, so you can predict pretty much um, anything. Now, Okay, so this is a cool toy model. Um, the, there are certain things we also need to know about the model. So first of all, so we, we, we talked about the probability distribution, but there are other things that are important for us. Um, and one other thing is a clustering coefficient, right? So clustering coefficient is really the, you know, or the transitivity, um, which is the number of uh, triangles in the nearest neighborhood. Right, so what we're trying to do is here's a node, here's neighbors, there is a connections here, there are connections here, and um, let's say this is what sort of neighborhood 
of a node looks like, and we're trying to calculate the clustering coefficient. And the clustering coefficient will be um, number of links between nearest neighbors divided by the maximum possible number of links between nearest neighbors, or number of triangles that has this node that we're interested in um, as one of the nodes of the triangle divided by the total possible number. And you can easily calculate this. And because the probability that two nodes are connected is P, um, in the formulas work out beautifully. So things cancels out. And the clustering coefficient by itself is equal to P. And, and, and that makes sense also because, again, remember, the clustering coefficient, though it has this sort of definition, it has the following meaning. It has the meaning that what is a probability that two of your friends know each other, right? So what the probability that there is an edge between two of your friends? Well, in the random graph model, this probability is equal to P as sort of probability for any edge in the graph. Um, and, and so clustering coefficient in this model is really equal to P. And that really means that it, it is very small. And again, if you look at the sort of real world networks, um, this is not um, the, the way clustering is in the real world networks. Um, but again, it's computable. The graph diameter is really also really easy to compute in this case. Um, if you notice, when the thing's just barely starting um, with, with this model, when, things get, when, when nodes get connected, they do look like a tree. They do look like a tree. And um, you know, for trees, you can always estimate the diameter as a logarithm of some of, of number of nodes. Well, the reason is, and I think we talked about this in the first lecture, you know, you take the first node, um, it has D neighbors. Um, so you know, in, in the first neighborhood, it will be D uh, you know, I'm sorry, take a node, it has K neighbors if a node degree is K. Um, on the second layer, it will be, of course, um, you know, K squared because um, there are on average K neighbors on the first layer and each of those neighbors on average has, you know, K neighbors and, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if you think about the tree, um, then all the nodes will be reachable, you know, after D steps from the center. And that means that, you know, diameter in general performs like, uh, you know, behaves like logarithm. Um, logarithm n divided by logarithm of, of um, number of uh, average degree. So the point is, the key here in this formula is the fact that it is um, that average, so, so sort of the diameter is proportional to logarithm of a number of the nodes. Right? So that's a, that's a critical finding. So you get more and more nodes, um, but the diameter is proportional to logarithm of that number. Um, so it means it's a small world because logarithm, um, you know, if you have, um, in, you know, if you have, uh, say, uh, 100 nodes, which is 10 to the second, right? So logarithm of 10 to the second is 2 log 10, right? If you have, say, 10,000 nodes, it's just 4 log 10. Um, so, we, which means, you know, the, the, the size can grow really fast of the graph, but the diameter will grow slowly. And this property is what's called small world property, which means, you know, you have lots of nodes, but the diameter stays small. So it grows very, very slowly. So in this case, um, you know, the, the, um, the model actually does behave like, you know, real life model. So that's sort of the, 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 the summary of, of this random graph model. Again, um, the model was invented, proposed in, um, in 1960. Um, and pretty much for the next 40 years, um, anybody who thought about you know, networks uh, thought that networks, in fact, follow this model. Because it, it, it's sort of such a nice um, you know, model and so sort of has very, very obvious ideas 
um, it's built on, right? So, you know, you think about the graph, how a graph is formed. Well, um, you know, it's just a bunch, bunch of nodes such that, and the graph is being formed by those nodes um, establishing sort of random connections between them, right? And, and eventually you get a graph because of those sort of random connections. Well, um, when, when scientists started studying um, networks in, you know, in, in the late 90s, and especially the internet, they found out that, in fact, um, the, the graph diameter, the diameter of the network, of the real world network is small, but at the same time, the distribution of the node degrees is very different. And the, this model cannot really explain it. And so people start thinking about other models, uh, how a graph forms. Um, and one of them, and this is sort of the second model we're going to talk about today, um, it, it kind of been motivated by the fact that um, in real life, networks actually grow with time. So they evolve. In some sense, this random network, original model with random network is, is fixed. You know, you have these two parameters, N and P. Um, in, and when, when we build the graph, well, it's done. What happens in, in real life, in many cases, many networks that we observe, they're actually changing with time. Just you know, think about this, like citation networks, right? So somebody wrote a paper, um, and, and then, um, you know, a few years later, people start citing it. So, you know, this paper got several citations. Um, and, and then a few more years passes by, and there is some new person, and he cites this paper, this paper, and might cite original paper. And then there is another person writing a paper, cites this paper, this paper, and maybe that paper, and maybe the original paper. And then, you know, somebody else but cite, only cites this paper, it's not the original paper. And so the graph is growing with time, right? Or collaboration network, you know, you start uh, meeting new people and you collaborate with different people as time going by. And, you know, of course, like social networks and web, they all grow and evolve with time. So it seems like this notion of evolution with time or growth is, is important in, in understanding um, network structure. And so it would be good to actually introduce that um, in, into the model. And in fact, there has been a lot of attempts to do it. Um, there are first models of things like evolving with time, not necessarily networks, um, but just the, the process, um, like citation, you know, has been studied um, you know, by Paula, by um, Udny Yule. Um, probably one of the famous studies is, is due to Herbert Simon, which is the distribution of wealth, and this is sort of, I'm sure you've heard about it, Rata distribution or reach gets richer. That's sort of where it goes from. Um, and um, there were several studies actually related directly to network. Um, and there is um, what's called the, the Jerry de la Sola Prize in 1976. He actually studied this network, the citation network, and how citation network growth. But his paper, um, well, pretty much went un unnoticed by, by a lot of people. But in 1999, uh, Barabasi and Albert, uh, they're actually physicists, um, they're looking at uh, the web, how web evolves. And they um, collected the data from the web um, and analyzed the web graph. And all of a sudden found out that the distribution of node degrees, um, not the one they, they, they expected to see, it doesn't follow the sort of Bernoulli distribution, doesn't follow a random graph model, but instead um, has this power law feature, the, the feature we talked about last time. And um, you know, to explain it, they came up with what they called preferential attachment network model. And that's a model that is probably one of the most popular models today um, describing um, social network, desc describing complex um, social networks. And um, you know, we're, gonna, we're gonna look at it right now. So the idea is the following of this model. It actually um, has two sort of, adds two new uh, properties to like random graph. So first of all, it says, okay, we're gonna do a dynamic model. So instead of actually having some number of nodes, the model will add nodes as we go. 
So it will grow with time. So there is this, now we have this parameter time and initially graph starts, you know, maybe with say two or three nodes. And then as time goes by, we not only add edges, but we also add nodes to the graph. So you know, think about it, new people joining social networks and start connecting um, with other members. So the graph is actually growing in terms of the number of the people involved, number of nodes. And the second um, main difference was how, how connections are formed, how attachment is formed. And here, the, what they propose is this model of preferential attachments. Um, and, and, and the idea is very simple. When the new node, uh, when the new node joined the graph, it has an option um, to which node is to connect, right? So um, let's say um, we have a new node joining the graph. In random graph model, in a sort of, you know, in, in normal random graph model, you know, there is an equal probability for nodes to be connected. In this model, the idea is the following. When you have a new node joining the graph, the node can establish certain number of connections, but it will establish connections with an equal probability. So it will have a higher probability to connect with the nodes of higher degree. So in this case, say for example, here is a node of, of degree three. So this node will connect to this node, I'll probably connect to this node, uh, with less probability connect maybe to this node, and almost never connect to this node. And, and so, um, you know, the, the intuition, you know, it, is very simple. Um, nobody wants to be friends with the losers, right? So, you know, you, you, you come to social network, you most likely connect to people who already have a lot of friends than connecting to someone who doesn't have friends. And that's, you know, the, the, the kind of the intuition behind this. Um, it's, it's again the same idea, like rich gets richer, right? So money goes to money. Um, so friends goes to friends. And uh, um, if you take these two processes into account, the fact that the network growing with time and the fact that uh, people prefer to connect uh, to people with lots of friends um, allows you to build this model that has properties very, very similar to real world network. Okay. And that's why this model is so popular. So, um, a little bit more formal, the idea is the following. At time equal uh, T0, the model starts with some number of initial nodes, N0 nodes. And on every step, we add a new node with M0 edges, so some number of edges. Um, so pretty much every node that comes into the, the system has to connect with, let's say, you know, with, with some number of neighbors, um, you know, with three or with five or whatever. And then the, this, this idea of preferential attachment, that the probability of linking to existing node is proportional to that node degree. So the probability to connect to the node of degree one is proportional to the node to the degree one, right? Um, the probability to, to connect to the node of degree 10 will be much higher. It will be 10 divided by you know, the total number of, um, of all the degrees. So the probability is written as a um, node degree divided by the total sum of uh, you know, other node degrees in the graph at the moment. Well, because it has to be a probability, so it has to be normalized. And um, again, as, as many times before, um, the sum over all node degrees is equal just twice number of edges in the graph. And if on every time step we add M0 edges, then after time T we get M0 uh, times T edges in the graph. And so the probability is equal to this. Again, the, the key here is that the probability is proportional to the node degree. The higher the node degree, the most likely new node will connect to this node. And if we try to draw it, you know, to do this little sort of simple cartoon um, to explain this idea, here is how this model works. 
let's um, the, the the node degree on this image is is proportional to well actually the the size of the node is proportional to the node degree right so the bigger the node the bigger um, the, the the bigger the circle I mean the larger the node degree the bigger the circle that shows it and uh, um, what's shown here is the model starts let's say with these three nodes connected and then the new nodes come in and it has to connect to one of the nodes and at this moment it doesn't really matter because all of the nodes that are there they have the same node degree so it just connects to let's say this one <coughs> and node degree of and this node degree increases because now you've got new connection so when an, the new node comes in um, there are these two nodes that high, have high node degrees because of you know the first node connected to them and so this node also connects to them when the third nodes come in um, it has a choice now to which node connect um, and it's with a high probability it connects to the node with a you know large node degree but you should remember that there is still randomness in this process and so you know node can connect uh, with the node of lower degree not necessarily with the highest um, degree but you know with, with the less probability and so on and you know as this process evolves we get to the point where we have this type of graph and um, you know in this type of graph you can easily see that there are some nodes of the very high degree and there are lots of nodes with a small degree and this is sort of a typical structure that we see for social networks so where we have some nodes of very high degree uh, relatively to other nodes and the majority has small degree very few people who are extremely rich and they're like really extremely rich and you know, the rest of the population is quite poor um, social network you know some people celebrities have extremely high number of connections majority has pretty small number of connections so that's the sort of the the, the underlying mechanism that can lead to this kind of uh, to this kind of uh, structure and that was was proposed by uh, Barabash and Albert in 1999 okay stop here um, any questions how you know about this model the, the, the sort of the mechanics is this is mechanics clear Yes, no, say something. <laughs> okay, all right. So, so the, the, the key here is again to understand the sort of the, the mechanics behind it, that the math is, is something that, you know, you can work out if you need to. Um, this is just a few formulas to get through the mathematics, uh, but the idea is very, very simple here. Um, it's so-called mean field approximation, which means, you know, averaging things. Um, imagine that at some moment of time the degree of the node is ki from t so that we have a node and it has uh, you know some neighbors and its degree is ki so the degree of this node and the next moment of time and the next moment of time will be when um, you know there is a new node comes into the play and it start connecting is actually uh, cal calculated be, can be very easily calculated it's really just proportional to the probability that the new incoming node uh, connects to this node. And to convert it into like, you know, probability into averages, you actually need to multiply on how many, um, how many edges a new node will bring in. And that's pretty much it. So um, I will not go through this. You can, you know, look through this now, how this is computed. It's, it's very straightforward. You take this equation, you convert it into, differential equation and uh, this is a differential equation initial conditions you just integrate it and it's solved the point is the following we can get the time evolution of the node degree in the model so remember um, the, there is a parameter which is time how things changes in this model um, and another parameter here is this node number and the way nodes appear the very first node will have number one the second node that was added to the system has number two the third node has um, number three etc and so the node degree of every node is proportional to the time and to the node number so node number which is i is when the node joined the system and t is the current time and this is sort of trivial, obvious, uh, but that what this function looks like. 
for different parameter for different eyes and um, this is actually very uh, interesting so let me let me talk a little bit more about this this, this curves so what we see here is, is the following um, we have a node that joined the graph at the moment um, right here was when the time was you know 10 units so that's when this node joined the graph and the node at that moment had three neighbors so we got this node with three connections it joined the graph at that moment and then the process continues and the node degree this node degree in increasing and let's say at time 40 this node will already has will already have a degree six which means you know it had original his own three degrees and then there are some nodes that joined the network also connected to this node and so its degree grew to six and then time goes by um, you know it degree grows to eight then there is another node right here the join this the join the graph later at moment 20 also initially with three nodes with three connections and then at time 40 you know there is one more connection appeared to this node somebody connected and, and so it so slowly grow and then there was a third node that that joined later and and you know it degree grow I mean you know that, that's what you would expect from this formula the really well, interesting and upsetting observation is the following. If you take a look at this um, at some moment in time, let's say you know we, we stop our clock at 60 and um, take a look at number of neighbors, node degree for every node. These curves, green, uh, blue, and, and red, they do not intersect. And that means that the node that joins later will never catch up in terms of the number of friends with the node who joined earlier. At any moment in time, green line is above blue line, above red line. So even if you join the social network, and the mechanics with which your number of friends growing is exactly the same as the mechanics for you know the number of friends growing for other people those who joined before you have a significant advantage and you will never exceed uh, the number of their friends so in some sense if you're as smart as the author of another paper and your paper as good as that paper but that paper was published before yours that paper will always have more citations than you do. If somebody uh, joined the market and, and start making money before you, and uh, he has an advantage, you'll never you'll not catch him unless you know your your growth rate is greater than that person. So you know this is sort of first comer advantage where uh, if ever everything evolves according to the same laws, there is no way to catch up. It's a little bit frustrating. Um, you know, the only way for to make these lines go differently is, you know, if you have a different mechanism, different mechanics of attracting friends. Yeah, then you can catch up with with originals. But other than that, if you're equal in every sense, um, then um, you know your your number of your friends will never exceed the number of their friends if they join before you. Okay, so that's what this model gives you. Okay, again, it's a model. It's not real life. But you know, the model reflects a lot of things that we have in real life. So from this formula, one can actually calculate the, the distribution function. One can calculate the function that we, we computed for, uh, for random graph. Um, and in this case, the probability that a node has degree k is uh, inversely proportional to that, no, to that degree, which is k to the third. So p that a random um, node has degree k is really pr proportional to 1 over k cubed. And that's power law. So this model gives us um, the sort of the power law, the one that you know, we, we were looking for. 
And on this picture, I'm showing you two different um, distribution functions. One, um, the blue one, is um, two. So the, the, the blue distribution function is this one. So it is for random graph. It is the one we, we looked at, the, the sort of the, the, the Poisson distribution, where um, you know, we'll see, let's say, in, in this distribution, on average, node has uh, you know, the, the, the maximum number of neighbors, I'm sorry, the, the most probable number of neighbors for a node is 10, right? And, and um, you know, then you have nodes with a smaller node degrees um, that are here, and you have nodes um, with a higher node degrees, but there are not that many of them. On the other hand, the red one is given by this formula, is this power law distribution, which says, okay, we don't even see it here, it goes th through the roof. So the, the probability that the node degree is small is very high, and the probability that, you know, that, that, that we have node degrees with a large degree distribution is sort of above this, this um, blue line. So if we draw this in the log log scale, so this is gonna be log k, and this is gonna be log p, you know, the red line will definitely look like will be a straight line. Uh, okay, will be a straight line. Um, and, and the blue line will most lo will, will look something, you know, like, like, like this, no. Something like that quickly decreasing. And, and, and so the straight line is a signature of power law degree distribution, and last time you, you've seen that. And so this model, in fact, does give us a power law degree distribution. So in, in this sense, it is um, much more realistic than um, the random graph model. And this is what those graphs look like. So um, if we take um, M0 equal to 1, um, M0 equal to 1, which means on every, every new node uh, brings just one degree, so when a new node is connected, it just brings one degree, um, we, we're gonna get this sort of tree-like structure. If every node that comes in brings you know, two degrees, that's what's gonna look like. If every node that comes in brings three degrees, in degrees, that's what's gonna look like. Um, I didn't scale nodes here according to their node degrees, though I should have if I did, but it, it's, it's still, you still can see here that there are some nodes right there in the center, like sort of the, the oldest nodes that have the highest um, node degrees here. It, it's very clear. And, and even, even in this picture, you can see there are some nodes with a very high node degrees, but the majority of the nodes have a degree, uh, you know, one here, so very small degree. So again, this idea that there are few very rich people, there are few nodes that have lots of friends, very high node degree, majority has low degree. And again, you know, you, you, you're lucky iGraph just provides this function. You can actually call that function with different parameters, and, you know, you can experiment and get those graphs. So the graph do have this power law degree distribution. You can calculate an average path length, and it's a small world graph. And you can calculate a clustering coefficient for this model. It's not as, as nice and clean as, as before but uh, in the previous models, but you can do it. And um, you know, this logarithm of the no of, of the number of the nodes as their um, average path lengths is good because that's like real life. This is all like real life, but the model doesn't give us good clustering coefficient. Unfortunately, it, it, it fails there. So this model, you know, gives two parameters out of three, gets two out of three right. And that brings us to like the last model before we go to that model. Um, any questions about this? Okay. So it's called preferential attachments. It gives you the scale free network. Um, it gives you this, you know, reach get richer phenomenon, right? And, and, and there are two factors that gives you this. First factor is that it's dynamically growing. So you know, you're adding nodes all the time that a new people comes into the system. 
And the second is that when people come into the system, they prefer to connect to those who already have lots of friends. So those two major factors in this model that makes it very different from this random graph, just from a random graph. OK, so this is the last model we're going to talk about today. Um, it's called the small world model. Um, in fact, this is sort of, I would say, the most intuitive thing you can possibly do. Um, so what we want to do is we want to have a network that have high clustering coefficient. And high clustering coefficient means, again, that you know, you have, if you have two friends, then it is a high probability that they know each other. And that really means you have triangles. So you need to have a lot of triangles. And, and so the idea of the small world model um, is the following. Let's start from the model that has lots of triangles. OK, this is sort of, uh, uh, you know, th this model was proposed also by physicists. And physicists like systems um, that, are, that do not have boundaries in some sense, right? And so, you know, you look here at this sort of circle. So you don't have to, to worry about what happens at the end. Um, and uh, so it's called periodic boundary conditions. And um, you, know, you, you can easily see here there are a bunch of triangles. And if we want to calculate the clustering coefficient, um, in, in this case, you, know, you, you pick up this node, and it has, um, so these are the neighbors. And it has um, one, two, every node has um, three connections. And the node degree is four. So the clustering coefficient will be um, three connections divided by maximum number, which is four times um, three. And, and this is over two, which gives you one half, right? So this network has lots of triangles, which is obvious, and it also has very high clustering coefficient. But the diameter of this network, though, this is a very small network. The diameter is pretty large. Diameter is the shortest path from you know, one, the, the longest shortest path. And if I pick up, say, this node and this node, well, I still need to go you know, across um, to reach from this node to that node. So it's going to be pretty long. And so the question is, how do we, on one hand, preserve this high clustering, but on the other hand, get, uh, you know, get, get you know, sh small diameter. And the way to do it is very simple. Well, we can, we can just say, oh, well, you know what? Let's add extra long range connections. So you know, just let's take this node and connect to, randomly to that node. Take this node and connect randomly to that node. Take this node and connect randomly to that node. Take this node and connect randomly to that node, and etc. right? So we can put a lot of sort of long range connections in here. And all of a sudden, if you want to connect, a sh if you, so first of all, if you want to jump across the sort of this ring, um, you know, from this node, say, to this node, um, your, short, your, your shortest path will not be anymore around the ring. But you can, for example, do one, say, two, three, and four, and you are there, OK? Um, so it dramatically reduces graph diameter if we do things like that. But at the same time, it doesn't break the triangles. And, and so we still have you know, small diameter and large clustering. And so the question is, we, have here, we, can, we should have here a parameter, some parameter that controls you know, how many of those uh, long range connections you can have. And there are two versions of this model. One version actually adds those long range connections. Another version of the model just does rewiring, which means you know, we can preserve the total number of edges, uh, but say, OK, we can take this triangle and, and sort of take this edge and, for example, wire it somewhere else. Now, that will reduce the number of triangles, but it will preserve the total number of, of edges in the graph if we're concerned about that. But the whole point is the following. Take a model that has high clustering coefficient and just add extra edges or rewire it um, randomly such a way that it will have long range connections. And these long range connections will give you uh, the small world. 
So if you think about social network, the idea is the following. You, I'm sure among your friends, you know, the majority of your friends are either your sort of classmates or, or you know, people you went to, you know, to, to high school together or maybe, you know, friends from uh, your whatever hobby you have, right? That's the majority. And in fact, um, these people also know each other, you know, because you're in the same group in college or because, you know, your, your hobby is very similar. So these people, you might have, you know, several clusters in, in your sort of friendship neighborhood. But at the same time, I'm 100% I'm sure that on your Facebook or contact you or anywhere else, you will have some friends. You don't even know where the heck they came from, right? So somebody said, hey, let's be friends. And you say, yeah, whatever. Or, or you met someone somewhere once and, uh, you know, all of a sudden they added you to your friend list and they're there. So these are long range connections because those people, they also have their own little world somewhere out there. And, um, you know, you connected to them by whatever reason. And you probably have several, you know, pretty much can guarantee that you'll have a few people in your profile unless you're like very, very, you know, like, like to clean your profiles, you, you most likely do have those long range connections with that sort of group of people. Then there is probably some other group of people and, you know, some other sort of random long range connection. And so what happens, um, there is a high clustering coefficient because of your like sort of, you know, friends and neighbors. And then there is this long range connection that just takes you to like very different, very far away from you part of Facebook or social network. And that what, and now think about this. If you, if you like that, pretty much everybody else is also like that. And so, you know, Facebook in general will have this short range and long range connections. And that what makes it, makes it a small world. Okay. And this model that actually just tries to mimic that behavior. There is nothing else in here. So the model was proposed by Watson Strogatz in 1998. And this is a single parameter model. And, and the parameter here is really the, the ratio, the, the, the number of this sort of long range connections. And uh, what happens if this, uh, you know, the parameter is equal to zero, we're in the case of, um, you know, regular graph, sort of very regular connectivity structure like we saw on, on the previous picture. And in the case when the this long range connections dominate, and, and in particular in their case, they, they did not um, add the long range connections, they rewired, meaning they replaced the direct connections by random long range connections. And so when P is equal to one in their case, um, the connectivity is entirely random. And so you're in the sort of random graph mode. So you go from regular, from the lattice, to random. And the parameter, this rewiring parameter that adds long range, um, that you know, either rewires or adds long range connections, that's what actually controls transition from lattice to random. And in the lattice world, you have um, very high clustering. Um, in the random world, you have you know, very short connections. In, in the lattice, you have a very long pathways from one end to another. Um, in, in the random world, it's, it's quick and short. So in some sense, it, when the parameter is equal to one, you get here to model number one we considered today, which is um, erdos rini random graph, right? So it transitions from regular lattice to this random graph model. Um, and, and this is sort of the visualization from their paper. So as I, as I said, um, compared to what we did a couple of minutes ago, when they take this regular lattice, um, instead of just adding, say, you know, long range connections, they rewire them. They, re they, they take this local connection um, and from here they rewire it to randomly to any other point in the graph. And, and so if you keep doing it with every other node in the graph, well, you'll get some sort of, you know, random graph. But the interesting part becomes here is when the model stays in between regular and random structures. And so on one hand, it still keeps the sort of local connections. It still have, you know, local friends, but at the same time, um, it does have, uh, you know, long range um, connections. And so it, it connects to the people um, from outside, outside world. Again, this sort of looks like 
if you think about you know the, the social network these are your friends family uh, you know your local connections this is when you set up a profile and connect it to like entirely random people um, in the network okay that's what it's going to look like and, and so you know in real life you're probably somewhere in between you have lots of you know your, your real sort of local friends but you do have some random people in your in, in your world and um, you know there is an, you, you can go through analysis and and look um, at how um, the the distance the average distance um, and how clustering coefficient changes depending on this parameter and you can show that um, you know if you um, increase sort of increase the value of this parameter you go from a large clustering coefficient which is equal to one from like of all the triangles you can slowly decrease this number of triangles and then eventually you know the, the triangles will disappear and you can also show that um, if we, when you're in in this structure in the situation of the um, of the regular uh, graph the diameter is pretty large but then it decreases and so you know if we choose a parameter somewhere here you will still catch you know, large clustering coefficient and small diameter. And that was sort of the result of this paper, that uh, within this one parametric model, you can choose a parameter that at the same time preserves clustering, but gives you small world effect. Unfortunately, this model, um, the de degree distribution that model th this model gives, or so the, the, the node degrees, the probability of the nodes to have certain degrees, it's still Poisson, it's still, uh, you know, it's still like random graphs, so it's not a power law. And here is an example. It's also generated by, you know, by, by iGraph. What Strogat's game um, just took this sort of um, well-connected regular lattice with lots and lots of triangles and did like random rewiring. And you can calculate average path lengths. You know, on, on this graph, um, the average path lengths on the left was 3.58 and on this one by adding 20 percent of uh, random rewiring so 20 percent of of edge of edges were rewired from being local to somewhere you know further away in the graph um you dramatically reduce average path lengths and well at the same time yes you do reduce clustering coefficient but that's the whole point right so you, you try to find sort of the balance in between um you know very um, connected model and, 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 and somewhat random. So to sum up for today, we, we looked at three very different models. Um, there is this random graph model, which is erdos Scherny model. Um, there is what's called uh, barabashi albert model of preferential attachment, right? This is preferential attachment model. And this is what Strogan's uh, small world model, right? Um, and, and this is like what we have in, in real life, empirical networks. So empirical networks, we know that they have power law degree distribution. They have a large clustering coefficient. So you have, you know, if your friends know each other and, you know, it's a small world. And each of the three models we studied today give you different predictions about this. And for example, random graph um, gives you small world, right? But does not give you... Um, correct power law distribution or clustering coefficient. The barabashi albert model give you correct prediction for the power law distribution and, and give you a pretty good prediction for the small world. And what Strogan's model gives you actually correct prediction for um, uh, clustering and it gives you pretty good prediction for the small world. So, you know, each of those models hit and miss. Um, but it's good to, you know, to have an impression on, you know, how things can be created. And in fact, we'll be using um, quite a lot this, this random model for the comparison purposes, purposes that I said. And, and these models, they're usually um, sort of good um, when you try to explain why network um, looks the way uh, it looks. And there are several publications, the, the, the famous um, Erdash and Rene paper of 1959 about random graphs, um, um, the, the Watts and Strogatz paper on a small world networks, and it's actually it's nature publication. Um, and um, there is uh, this uh, random uh, preferential attachment by Barabash and Albert, it's actually a science publication, 1999. 
So that's uh, it for today's uh, topic. Any questions? And I cannot even see you guys anymore. It's so dark in the room. <laughs> I'm sorry, our PC uh, may shut down right now. Okay. I'm not sure what's the purpose. <laughs> okay, thank you. We'll start classes after break. Okay, all right, cool. Thanks.